take a moment and introduce one of my dear friends, Jim Keenan. He runs the blog, a sales guy in a great consulting practice. He's now a Forbes author. Yeah, baby. <laughs> and we've got Jamie Shanks, uh, one of the leading consultants in LinkedIn, Sales for Life. I met Jamie a couple years ago. We've done some fun projects together. And uh, I want to talk about my dear friend, Gabe Viamazar, 4 million said sales.com, now higher view, one of the thought leaders in the world, on, especially on Twitter, this dude rocks, and our own Michael Hanks, we're going to share some of the secret sauce of InsideSales.com. So we're going to jump in, and the first big question, does social selling really work? What are your thoughts, guys? Is it really working out there? This doesn't work. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Turn on the mics, baby. I think, the, okay, it's working now. The easiest way to describe it is I wouldn't be here if it didn't work. I wouldn't have a business. Uh, that's, uh, but there is no question that sales professionals have an opportunity to meet the buyer where the buyer is already doing due diligence, which is online. So it absolutely does work. I was just talking to one of our biz development guys yesterday, asking him what he's seen when he started utilizing some of the strategies. And he just yesterday scheduled a new appointment through his social selling tactics. So it's obviously working and he's brand new and he's already seen a ton of things happening. So definitely. Cool. Anyone else? No question. That's huh? just a silly question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> duh. Losing my ear kids. Sorry about that. The okay. real question was why didn't I get the red memo? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was pre-planned. It's higher than your red. Must be that Forbes article about, yeah, I, heard, I read that one about red. Okay, definition of social selling. Is social selling really selling? Are people closing sales with social selling? So I believe that they're facilitating earlier on in the buying journey. And that, uh, that poses both for an inside sales professional trying to drive leads into opportunities and from account management trying to create groundswell, cross-sell and upsell within an existing account, socially surrounding that account. Um, does it close a deal? No, but there's empirical evidence that it shortens the sales cycle and increases the opportunity from lead, or from lead to opportunity. But there is still the person-to-person -person interaction that is meant to drive and close that sale. So you typically bridge from the social media is what you're saying? My goal is to take the world online to offline as fast as possible as long as it doesn't create a, a break in that chain. So if I go offline too quickly, I've not built enough insight and value. So I keep them online to the point where I feel it's a perfect opportunity for us to have real live conversations. Yeah, and we've actually been interviewing a lot of uh, sales thought leaders and social selling thought leaders. And I can kind of um, agree with what they're saying how, I mean, Back in the day, you don't, you don't, you wouldn't say, "Oh, fax selling, or phone <laughs> selling, or um, you know, email selling." It's gonna be, it's, it, that, that, that's a, it's a buzzword for sure, social selling. But a few years from now, it's just gonna be known as selling. We just identify as social selling because since 2004, 2003, all these social media networks came out of nowhere, and digital natives grew up with all these social media uh, channels, and they're integrating it now into the, the workforce. And a lot of uh, baby boomers, Gen X, or other generations are like, oh, what's this? You know, maybe we should integrate it as well. So in a few years down the road, it's just going to be called selling. But um, you better embrace it, do it, and uh, if now you're going to be left behind. I'm not giving you any more interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Take a minute, you guys, and talk about your own social media of choice. Where, where do you spend most of your time? And uh, tell us a little about you and your own personal world of social media. I spend most of my time on Twitter and blogging. Um, a lot of people don't see blogging as social selling, but in my opinion, at the, at the base of social anything, you have to have something to share. You have to have something to talk about. You have to have something to collaborate with. So if you don't have a home base for your information, for your uh, content to share and provide value, then you're relegated to sharing other people's and that makes it more difficult to drive your value. So mine is a blogging or some sort of home base for content first. And then secondly is the idea of Twitter. Twitter's open and that's what I like the most about it. 
Um, it, it can spread faster. You can find people, engage with them quicker. You have access to them easier. So I like the, the fluidity and the velocity that Twitter creates that LinkedIn is phenomenal, but it, I don't find it as, as fluid and as the velocity that Twitter does. My company's buyer personas, we have three. We have, and they're all the vice president level, sales, marketing, and enablement. And because of that, the medium of choice for us has always been LinkedIn. Now, there's two parts to that, and Jim already solved part one, as you just described. So LinkedIn is the vehicle in which I communicate, but I need something of value to communicate with. And for us, that would be content in the form of really three major types of assets. Blogs, videos, and or webinars, and ebooks. And that's the, that's the, the resources that we use to strike up conversations using the platform of LinkedIn and then drawing them out of LinkedIn to have real life conversations. Yeah, for me, like Ken says, it has to be Twitter. Um, it's uh, a lot of inside sales reps are starting to uh, adopt Twitter and you can know who's talking about what, what are they interested in, what hashtags do they use, um, who's their favorite sports team, what days of the week do they tweet the most, who do they engage with the most. If you can study and gather all that sales intelligence, and attach it to a link, or attach it to a contact or a prospect, then I would know if I want to sell something to Jamie, I'd be like, oh, Jamie, saw that you were skiing yesterday. Um, and then we would talk about skiing, right? Or Michael, oh, I saw that you like the NBA or the Utah Jazz, and I would kind of bring up something about the Utah Jazz. It's no longer a cold call. So if you integrate Twitter with your traditional selling and email and, and, and cold calls, it, it makes the whole world a difference because it makes you identify like the Steve uh, Richard from Voresight VP, the three by three research. Find three things for a prospect in, in less than three minutes. So that helps me identify um, what the prospect's all about and who they're talking to and, and things of that nature. Yeah, and I have to agree with all these guys. We try to focus at Inside Sales of training all of our reps to make sure they have the best type of content which will land in, uh, in blogs and making sure that they're keeping their LinkedIn as a base, when putting all their fundamentals there, and then from there using Twitter as a megaphone. And so those would be our two main ones as well. You know, if you heard what he said, we, we have two main elements, and this is something I want to talk about. It's probably the biggest aha I've had in the last year on social media, and Mike Hanks helped me find that. I call it the picture catcher methodology. And Twitter is a picture, but you've got to have a catcher. If you don't have a way to catch that tweet that drives to a landing page on a website, on a blog, um, slideshare.net, really, really cool, and that converts it to a lead, you have no results. Now, I drove Gabe crazy. I'm driving Mike crazy on one word called results. Am I right? Oh, yeah. How many times do I call you guys in and say, guys, if it doesn't drive results, it doesn't matter, right? And we were recently ranked number one in the world because of that one thing. If it doesn't drive results, it doesn't matter. But Mike, would you take a minute and walk through what you found with that picture catcher methodology? And I want each of you to take a minute and talk about how do you turn your social media into results? Yeah. So that's one thing that uh, we feel social media is uh, going down a new road or uh, driving that new path with making sure that the content is leading you to a place to get a lead, to make and get the results you need. And so we found that we actually have hundreds of thousands of people visiting our SlideShare uh, website all the time, downloading a, a lot of the slides that we do. And, and we found that by being able to pitch that type of content that the people want, leads them back to a reg form or whatever that helps drive them down the funnel of understanding what ins Inside Sales does. And then once they know what we do, um, they'll, they'll continue down that pipeline and we'll get the lead and it'll start driving better results. Yeah, so this, uh, no, because of Ken, I remember Ken called me like 11 p.m. one time. My wife's like, who's calling? And it was <laughs> Ken <laughs> because he really wanted to know, Gabe, how do you drive value from Twitter? He's like, I have the, over 30,000 followers, but I'm still so, like, really want to know. And I know he, he, he saw the value, but the value is always evolving. So with my good friend here, Peter Chung, he just recently joined HireVue. We really wanted to see the results of how to use traditional selling with social selling. So then traditional selling, you call a prospect, maybe have two dials per day, leave a voicemail and send an email. That's, just, that's how you prospect nowadays. Well, how can you accelerate that process with social selling? 
Well, instead of calling and, and sending a voicemail, then why don't you call them, leave a voicemail, send a LinkedIn invite, and say, I just want to make sure you got my, my voicemail. Then find them on Twitter, tweet at them, and always go back to the previous action. And then that way you can accelerate the whole process and almost have 9 to 12 touches per prospect in a 72-hour window. So if you can accelerate how many touches you have per prospect through social media, you're going to stand out. I mean, how many emails can you get per day of people trying to sell you things? Oh, my gosh. I'm in the 300 exactly. range. <laughs> but if you were to reach out on Ken through Twitter or LinkedIn or through an email, you have higher chances of getting a hold of him because you're standing out from the norm. You, you're different. You're like that purple cow like Seth Godin says. Or comment on his blog posts. Oh, he loves it. Yeah, yeah baby. Baby. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Be different. And uh, so integrate social selling with traditional selling. And Peter, how many touches um, do we have per week uh, with traditional and social selling? Like over 20, 30? I don't know. Well, you know, I, I'm pretty new still to HireVue, but one of the first things that we did is, is process overhaul and building that into the process, building that into our CRM, building that into our training so that there's a discipline around that. So now we can have that visibility that I learned from Ken to be able to define those results. We actually have that visibility to say, how many LinkedIn messages is it going to take to get this thing set? And then during, and then it'll actually pass on to our closers. How many social media touches? And we can actually go in. We've built our CRM or, or, or tweaked it a little bit so that we can have that visibility to say what types of touches led to that, right? And we can see in the various stages of the sale. So everybody in the audience, raise your hand if the sales organization, the entire ecosystem of your company, is larger than 50 sales professionals or more. Just raise your hand. Because it's the vast majority of this room. The reason this is a value is let's look at somebody that runs a marketing department. As running a marketing department, you have a Twitter arm, a Facebook, a LinkedIn account, and it has X number of total followers or friends, or whatever you'd like to call it. The problem in most organizations is marketing has been that distribution army of content. And it's only as powerful as, quote unquote, like their, it's their database. It's a, almost like a version of a CRM, except social. You have a team of 50 or greater. Think about the scale of 500 or 1,000 sales professionals. Sharing content, you then become the distribution army. We're all here because we're involved in inside sales. Well, that distribution army is on average connected to 500 people. Now, their, their social reach might be a percentage of those people are your real target buyers, but the other people know other people that can introduce them. The whole concept here is imagine empowering these people to share content. We were talking about the conversion funnel. Sharing blogs that are really insightful and they pose the question of why. And at the end of that is a call to action to a larger gated asset like an ebook or a webinar that answers the question of how. All of a sudden, your inside sales team has an influx of inbound leads far faster than, say, the traditional telephone sometimes can do because you are able to touch people at a rapid pace. And if you empowered all these people to do this in a repeatable process, you're scaling inbound leads at a, at a pace you, you couldn't have imagined before. I, I'm going to add a little piece to this and torque can a bit. In, <laughs> Throw baby. Yeah, and so it's part a little. One of the things that, that I have found that we can do to get more value and measure social media is not try to be so freaking linear. Right? Management says, I can see Ken calling him at 11 o'clock, I want to know how this one Twitter fall is going to get me this one lead for this one uh, product. Right? We're looking for that one-to-one. -one. Everybody wants to see it, feel it, touch it, and feel good about it. But what I'm learning and what I think people need to do is be open a little more and don't have to necessarily know that XYZ lead came in from XYZ piece of content or XYZ um, social chapter or social ch excuse me, channel. I got a call today from a guy who wants one of our recruiting services. And he said, oh, I was, came in directly through me from email. And he said, I was recommended by a friend. So of course I said, well, who's your friend? I had no clue who this person was, none. So something we've done got to this person to the point that they were like, well, yo, you need to call these people, right? So don't be so tight assed about where the leads come from, count them all up and give them credit to your program and you'll get more value. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take a minute on this next slide. This is huge, you guys. This came from a research study on business to community. 
and the research was done on high growth companies, companies that grow 15 times faster than the norm. See, I was right blogging. And I look win. at number one, you guys. The blue is the high growth companies. The orange is average growth. The number one platform for these high growth companies was a blog. Can I get a witness? Baby. <laughs> now, Trish and I used to debate, what the heck good is a blog? Remember that? We call, you get it. And all of a sudden, one day she said, wait, wait a minute, Ken. My biggest deal came off the blog. And things started going. And that's when I realized there's a huge synergy. I'm going to call a blog, it is social, but I'm going to also call it digital because people don't realize what a blog really is. It's your own magazine. Yes, it is. Because everybody else is going out of business. Forbes is a WordPress blog. It's your own place to put up your own dang content and bypass those expensive middlemen. So the blog, in my opinion, is the catcher's mitt for your content. Now, let's take a minute. Which of these up here are pictures? Which can you go out down and send thousands or hundreds of thousands of pitches to the catcher's mitt? Most of them. Search will drive it. LinkedIn will drive it. Twitter, email, email especially. But look at, look at email, you guys. The average companies wear out email. They drive us nuts to the point where they pass a, scam, pam, a spam act and, and, and want to outlaw it because we all hate it. But if you follow the model of opt-in on a blog and people want great content, they will never opt out. But the synergy is email and blog, Twitter and blog. This would look better as a graphic and a hub and spoke. Yeah. With the blog in the middle and then arrows pointing in the direction in the information should go. So sometimes it's bilateral, sometimes it's one directional. Maybe you add your little pitcher catcher thing to each line, but this would look much, much better and provide more value Next time. if it was in a hub and spoke with the blog right in the middle. Cool. So let's talk about that, you guys, your experience with sort of a pitcher catcher model. Um, you got content, you got a way to get a distribution and turn it to a lead. W what kinds of things do you do to turn things into leads? 50% of my entire company's revenue comes from content marketing. It's the simplest way to look at it. Now, which piece of content? I completely agree with Jim. We taught organizations for the longest time that there was a linear correlation between said ebook and said lead. What we're finding, and it started with and stems with our own business, is that I'll, as an example, meet a buyer at a trade show, and they'll have said, and they'll know who I am. For the last three months, I've been reading your content. We downloaded these three ebooks, went to one of your webinars, and I noticed you're connected to company ABC. I've already reached out to them, said you're a great guy. I think your company. And so to Jim, Jim's point, it's not as linear as we once thought. But the whole is greater, than, uh, there's no question, synergy, the whole is greater than some of its parts. We, as an example, concentrate, as I mentioned before, on three major types of assets. Blogs, but we embed video into that blog. E the, uh, mir mirroring to ebooks and then to webinars itself, all to download. It is 50% of our entire company's revenue. If, if we just stopped for a day, the machine stops moving. It is the most critical piece above and beyond, say, referrals or conversations in LinkedIn. It's the baseline. Yeah, I like to just call it the social uh, selling process, right? If you were to get anything from what I said today, you might want to write these three, four things down. Number one is optimize your social profiles. Number two is listen for the right trigger events. Um, and I'll get into that in just a little bit. Number three, share the right content. And number four is engage in a non-creepy way. Because I can find anybody that's talking about, I, I want to go to uh, the Jason Mraz concert. Anybody that's tweeting that, I can find them. I can find anybody who's talking about certain keywords and they're very low-hanging fruit, right? Well, if I, don't, if I reach out to them in a cold call way through Twitter or LinkedIn, it's still going to scare them. So don't think that social selling is going to be your solution and you have to stop call, cold calling and emailing. You have to do a really good balance. But the m most important part for us is listening. If I can enable all 75 of my inside sales reps how to listen, it's awesome. So, for example, anybody who's used the hashtag ISA15, I, I'm tracking every single one who's doing that. What I'm going to do after that is enable all my inside sales reps to say, reach out to all these people and ask them if they came to our booth. Reach out to these people and follow them. Reach out to these people and reply to them. So if you listen for the right trigger events, when people have uh, changed jobs on LinkedIn, through, through LinkedIn Sales Navigator, if you reach out to them when um, they have a birthday, when you reach out to them when they're tweeting certain words, 
when you reach out to them if when they change jobs because they want to still be a superstar at their next job so they're more open to buying new software. So listen to a lot of those uh, trigger events through LinkedIn Sales Navigator and through Twitter and, and things of that nature. Just, uh, uh, just wanted to add one thing. For many people in the audience, you may feel, well, the buyer persona that we sell to isn't that social savvy, isn't yeah. using, it using it as much. Finance, IT, human resources. If you sell into one of those three, sales and, and marketing you already know are heavy adopters of LinkedIn. But if you sell into the IT, finance, or HR function, it will blow your mind how, how many millions of these people, just in North America, are engaging and leaving what I call digital breadcrumbs. They're, leave, they're giving you insight into their business. You just have to figure out how to grab it. And I would just echo what they said. One thing that I would add, though, is we uh, basically what Gabe was saying was spot on, and that's something that we try to teach all of our, our, our reps over at Inside Sales. The one thing that we do is we make sure that they are all spot on on their core social media. So Ken has an amazing seven steps or seven levels of social media, and the number one is making sure you're good at your core, and then within that there's the six C's. And so we make sure we train each and one, all of our reps, or everybody in the company actually, to be spot on and build out their social presence and then utilizing exactly the same tactics that they were saying in, those, in their social presence. Uh, but the one thing that we make sure that they don't do is w every, every week I train all the onboarders that come into our company and I just make sure I tell them, don't be the mall kiosk kiosk guy because how many people ever go to the, the mall and you're and you're just walking down and there's the lotion guy and he's trying to give you that lotion you're like ah, you got to do one of these and you walk on by and so when you're on when you're online and you're social selling you can't be this overly aggressive it has to like Keenan was saying it just has to come naturally you have to just nurture you just have to make sure that you're a thought leader and that's something that we definitely stress within the company you know it, these guys nailed it in and how many people here have millennials that work for them as a SDR or some type of sales visit? And how many of these millennials are pretty good with social media? So I have a couple. And this was a, almost a rude awakening. And working for me is an interesting experience. So I come in, and these kids, yeah, good kids, bright kids, uh, one of them I call a, a golden retriever puppy. I mean, he's like, what can I do next? What can I do next? I mean, this kid is awesome. But, and he was super social. He knew it all. But he didn't know how to apply it for business business. And so don't assume, and this is my advice on this topic, is everything they said is spot on, but you're going to need to provide an infrastructure for them, and you need to train them, and you need to teach them on two elements of social selling. One being the soft skills of social selling, and that's don't be the mall kiosk guy, right? But the other one is the hard skills of social selling. Like what, my golden lab retriever guy, Max, if you're watching, that you um, were streaming on Meerkat. He, it never dawned on him to use Hootsuite, create a list of all his clients, a list of his current clients, and then f check them out once a day. Like, it just didn't dawn on him. So it made me realize there's a lot that I needed to teach them and I needed to put in place for them so they not only understood social in, its, in itself, but how to leverage social for business and get the most out of it in a functional, hard way. So I really recommend that. Thank you. We're finding, oh man, that's my favorite thing you just brought up. Uh, we, we, we distill it down to what we call the six C's of social media. And if you don't follow that, you follow the one C, which is chaos. And we're finding that everywhere. So this was actually done recently for a, a nationwide certification program for the Boy Scouts of America, but mostly for their adult leaders who don't have a clue. It's really funny. So level one is what we call the core. I'm just going to hit this really fast and I want to bring up some of these things too as we coach other people on the core. Curator. Let's talk about curation for a minute. There's some fun things you can do to move around your content and other people's content to get results. Give us some of your ideas on how you curate content to, get to have it do what you want it to do. There's two important steps. You have to look at it as the individual sales professional, what can they do? And then what is an organization has to do individual sales professional. You can use a free tool called Feedly. And Feedly allows you to aggregate any blog in the world. So I'm listening to Lori's blog and Trisha's blog and Ken's blog. And it comes in a daily feed. It's mobile enabled. Literally, I wake up in the morning, pull open the nightstand, or pull up my phone on the nightstand, and I'm reading and deciding if any of this is valuable to my customer. 
But that's not very scalable in an organization. This is where you can go back and on Monday morning you're going to sit with your marketing team to explain the need for a content library. Because what happens is you're going to constantly onboard new sales professionals. They don't know the content that was written by the company 18 months ago. That's still of value to the market. What you need to do is arrange a content library mapped out to the buyer's journey based on stages. They dive into a certain stage and within it are assets that answer questions within that stage. And so that can be curated third-party content. It doesn't have to be just your company's content. It could be valuable content that answers questions at that very moment and that very stage. If you have those two, you're on the right path so far of being able to acquire content and distribute it quickly. Great. Any other thoughts on curation, using other people's content to further your purposes? Yeah, so I'm, I'm huge on that because a lot of people, when they jump on social, especially inside sales guys, they want to talk about me, me, me all the time. They treat it like a billboard, right? Mm -hmm. But remember, billboard only targets a cer certain amount of people. So what you want to do is uh, make sure you share, uh, let's say, your top inside sales blogs and have a rotation. I've, I've said this over and over um, because a lot of people want to see what kind of things you're tweeting, right? What kind of uh, content you're sharing on LinkedIn. And kind of be um, moderate and be aware of the type of audiences that are in each different network. Not everybody that's on Facebook is the same on LinkedIn. Not everybody that's on LinkedIn is the same on Twitter and Instagram, which is a huge upcoming platform that's going to take over, and it already has actually. And then Meerkat, there's so many of them. But um, what I'm trying to say here is make sure you talk about, uh, share, let's say if you share five tweets a day, your first three will be about third party content, your favorite blog. Uh, your favorite uh, company, etc. Then the, the fourth one's going to be a promotional tweet about your company or what you're trying to sell. And then the fifth one, retweet a sales thought leader or a marketing thought leader or your company uh, th th that you follow. By doing that, you're not going to annoy all your followers as in like, wow, Gabe, all he talks about is hiring you 24-7. Why would I ever want to follow him, right? So make sure you have a balance of how much content you share that's third party, uh, that's curated, and that's yours. And then even show your personality, right? People want to see, that's why Meerkat took off because you kind of, uh, it's a live video stream app that shows people what you're doing right now in this instant moment. So show people your personality. Take, take a selfie, take a picture of your dog, of your food. But if you do that 24 seven, it gets freaking annoying, right? So have a good balance and uh, use for, for that, for those two things, use Buffer app or use uh, Hootsuite to schedule those because otherwise you're gonna go crazy trying to tweet five times a day, right? How do you do that? You go crazy. Well, I'm, out, I'm already tweeting like 30 tweets uh, in two days because I've already scheduled them. Like Jamie said, at the beginning of the week, I sit down, spend half an hour, fill up all my content for the week. The one thing I'll, I'll add, and this is where Gabe and I perhaps think a little bit differently. Gabe coming from the marketing mind, I, myself coming from the sales mind. Being social for the act of being social, in my opinion, is a wa wasted energy. For myself, if I'm going to share third-party content, it has to drive not immediate return on investment, but long-tail return on investment, because it speaks to solving particular problems. Now, when you share content, I'm the biggest believer that you're really focusing, uh, when you're sharing it at the mass level, you're sharing it at the very early stages of the funnel, right? You're sharing from status quo to shifting priorities. So the type of content that I like to share at the mass level has to answer questions on why. Why should I do this? Why should I move off the status quo? What are general problems in the market? Why should I think differently? So the third party content that I'm going to share, I I'm a believer that I would rather a smaller network but extremely laser focused on one topic and I'm hammering the crap out of that topic and owning that topic and being able to solve problems for that topic rather than also being social for the act of being social. I would just add one word, uh, love. Uh, we're really big on showing love in terms of getting love. So you guys know Ken's huge on Forbes, and many of you probably have received emails from him to say, hey, I would love a comment on my Forbes, but you also know that if you ever have a book or something you want pushed, you would send it to Ken, and he's going to post that right then. And so that's one thing in terms of what everybody's saying, uh, show love to receive love, and it's just, just going to benefit everybody. But yeah. Read Adam Grant's book. Give and take. Say it right. Give and take. It's about the idea of giving and giving, giving in, in its correlation to success. Um, we have a, a page called a Sales Guy You, and you can get ebooks, tools, etc. But one whole section of it, 
whole section is everybody else's ebooks, videos. So we, we built a whole resource center around sharing other people's stuff. And the argument is if someone comes for Trish's stuff or someone comes for Lori's stuff, they can't help but trip over our shit. So, you know, give <laughs> and you get. It's that simple. So, yeah, put, make that the corner. That's the perfect tee up for level five, you guys, collaboration. I just finished three fun articles on YouTube, which I think is the holy grail of social media in relation to inside sales because remember inside sales is about mimicking the face-to-face -face sales model nothing can do that better than video so these youtubers have more impact than all of us thought leaders combined Lindsay Sterling has 850 million views <laughs> and she's a 25 year old girl who dances with a violin and I'm thinking holy crap so I asked her to tell us your story and she said there's one word collaboration I thought wait a minute wait a minute that's actually what we've all done to be here today, isn't it? I mean, we've collaborated on webinars. We've collaborate, collaborated on our big virtual summit. If we lift each other up, we each do better in our own space. So same thing, find non-competitive, in fact, I even do it with competitors, I don't care, <laughs> people who will lift you by you lifting them. People are good, they reciprocate, and you both do better. That big virtual summit we did with 82 thought leaders, that probably that one event made us the number one social currency company in the United States. They went, and we didn't know we were being measured, but what happens when you align the 82 best in one common direction? Oh, that's starting to make sense. So let's talk about collaboration and how it's impacted some of, of you guys and what you do and how you'd recommend we collaborate. You've been the godfather. You taught our business how to do this. There's no question. And again, I'm going to come back. A I don't want to sound harsh this way, but come back to the, the, the science of the lead gen side of it. When I'm looking at it from the perspective of creating, example, webinars. We use webinars all the time. The collective horsepower of Ken's social network and email and Jim's and Trish and Lori is far greater than our own. And as an organization, there's two real pieces of value. I'm going to create content that my network actually would find valuable and raise our level of insight. They'll see us as a more insightful organization. Part two, the more sales side of it, is the database that Jim, Ken, Lori, uh, Trish and Lori have, I'm able to leverage because their network are going to come to this webinar and I'll have a call to action asset to download afterwards. I'll see attendees, registrants, downloads. I have more leads for my lead gen team. So, Again, back to the art and the science, there's no question that the collaboration is far greater than just trying to drive social by yourself. Awesome. The best way to be collaborative is stop being so narcissistic. Know your information isn't better than everybody else's. Know you don't have a corner on the market. Know you're not better. You're one part of an ecosystem. Embrace the whole ecosystem. Beautiful. That deserves a hand right there, man. That was, that was pretty good. <laughs> That's why I invite Jim to these events, man. Anything else that applies on collaboration? Not after that. What do I tell you yeah. to do? What do I tell you guys to do for everybody here constantly? They wrote, wrote a book, what do I tell you to do? Go post it, go share it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, it's fun. It is. Everybody is good and they respond. So anyway, the last one, and this is the holy grail. The rest still doesn't matter. Collaboration even does not matter if you don't do this. Oh, wrong one, just a sec. The key is called action. I, I pulled up the wrong select, the core. Let me bring it over. Where'd you go, Ryan? Okay, here we go. Collaboration, but the key is skill number six called action, okay? So let's talk about calls to action and weaving them in to your social media. What do you think about when you say, okay, I'm gonna write something. How do I convert it to a result? The whole purpose is to continue the conversation, I feel, and make yourself be the thought leader that you need to be. And if there isn't the call to action to have people continue to engage with you, then nothing's going to happen. It's going to fall flat on its face. And especially if you're coming in to continue that conversation, the same thing, you can't be a drive-by commenter. You can't come in and say, hey, great article, and then stop. Because that's not driving the conversation, and nobody's winning when that happens. And so just being able to understand your market and ask the right questions to get everyone engaged and when you go on and comment on Ken's article or uh, Keenan's blog you ask questions to continue the conversation so everyone continues learning 
And, and make sure that your call to actions are not, I mean, all of us know when you're being sold to. And especially millennials, we know that when, what's an ad and what's not. What's going to be an ad and what's not, what's genuine and what's fake and what's real. So if you are going to add a call to action to um, the things you do, whether it's a tweet, a LinkedIn post, a blog, make sure, again, I'm going back to the same word I use, balance. Make sure you have a balance and because otherwise people become immune to your call to actions. Okay? So make sure that your hottest article or tweet or LinkedIn post is done at the right time and the right place. Because if you have add a crappy call to action to everything you do, people will become immune to you, and that's the last thing you want. I'll step back for a minute away from the content side of the call to action because I think as inside sales professionals, one of the things that would scare us is thinking, well, that sounds like a long tail strategy. Like I need to hit numbers next month and next month and next month. Tools like LinkedIn allow your team to roadmap relationships and be able to have conversations based on triggers, like job change alerts, people going in and out of organizations. I can see a sphere of influence around an entire university or college network and who could introduce me based on that shared tr life experience and trust. I can see the relationships of my own existing customers and how they can introduce. So the call to action, I'm just taking a different spin on this, uh, there can be the long tail call to action of downloading ebooks and assets, but there's also the ability to strike up conversations and that call to action that's immediate, as immediate as the telephone is. Uh, I'm not going to dis everything I think is spot on. I think the only thing I would add here is what we've learned is we don't believe there needs to be a call to action to everything. I mean, that's, again, that's give me, give me, give me. There's plenty of that in the world. Trust me, read your Facebook page. Um, we, so we, we break our assets down into what assets are we asking for, asking for that call to action, where it's actually give us their name and number. Then we have assets we say uh, that provides an uh, implied call to action, like a comment, or if you'd, if you'd like to learn more type of thing, then it's your choice, go here. But you can get everything without giving us anything. And then there's a content that says, we're not asking for anything. It's yours, free, we don't care who's watching it. And we, leave, we believe by having each of those classes, you have to pay attention to the type of content you create. We don't create content that asks for anything unless it's badass content. It's going to be really, really good because when you ask somebody for something, it is a transaction. When we say it's free, it's not free. One of my biggest pet peeves is when some clown comes to our site and puts in XYZ, XYZ, and that's their name. That's stealing. Just because you don't pay money doesn't mean the trans inherent transaction is there. I'm giving you something. Here's the deal. I will give you knowledge in exchange for your name and number. Okay? I could never walk into a store and say, hey, I like that computer, but I don't think they should charge us money, so I'm just going to give you fake money and take it. So why do we think we can do that with content? I'm going to work my butt off to give you... <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's, it's an exchange. So if you're going to ask... So this goes back to us. So if we're going to ask for something, my, my commitment to you is badass content. If you like it, give me a name and number. But I'm also going to give you content that you don't have to give me anything for. Enjoy it. Revel in it, roll in it, have fun with it, and it'll all come around full circle. Keenan's really, really good at that type of content. Sorry? <laughs> You're really good at that type of content. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Leo. Badass. <laughs> we got a question over here. That's not my gig. So, that's a great question. That's a great question. That's, uh, I'm going to listen to the answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so depends on what type of CRM you're using and which marketing automation. For example, I love, if you're on mobile, you don't want to fill out five, form, five lead forms, like first name, last name, email, where's your headquarter, where do you live, do you have a cat or a dog, you know? Make it as simple as possible. So uh, depends, again, HubSpot lets you use a multi-form uh, subject field. So, for example, if you do download something, um, it will ask you for your first name, and that's it. And then the next time you go to, to uh, another landing page that's related to that, where you got your content, it's going to ask you, what's your position? And then you put your position, and, and then you unlock the content. But make it as simple as possible. So, I mean, nowadays, all you really need most of the times is email. Because there's so many data uh, in sales intelligence where you can plug in the email, and then it will give you the rest of the fields. So... From my opinion, what I've seen is if you on mobile, if you optimize just for first name and email, or first name, last name, and email, and that's it, then I think you're going to see a higher conversion ratios of, of, of how many people download the content. 
or, or social access. Where they, oh, yeah, where your you, Twitter handle. Exactly. Yeah. All you need to do is mm -hmm. click to assign to your Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn, and then that information you then grab to be mm -hmm. able to access the asset. Exactly. I mean, how cool would that be if you download, if all you need to download an ebook is give me your Twitter handle. And then as soon as, soon as uh, you download that, then that Twitter handle will go to an inside sales rep. The inside sales rep says, thank you for downloading the ebook. And they're like, holy crap, like, how did you do that? No one's ever done that. You usually I'm used to getting an email or getting a phone call. So think outside the box of how you can generate uh, different uh, forms of commun communication with social media. Okay, we're going to start opening up more questions. Anybody? Okay, question right here. We'll get a mic running around here. All right, maybe. We'll share mics up here so we can hand them out to the audience so everyone can hear. Uh, in, the, in the conference, we've talked a lot about the SDR role, and then there's account executive. So my question with the social selling is uh, what, maybe what role focuses more on the social selling, or is there a mix of, of how much social selling each role would do? Can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Simple concept, every deal, every day. And every, every function within the organization needs to be leveraging it. Uh, I, I'm the biggest believer that one of the, uh, we had everybody raise their hand and they work in an organization with 50 sales reps or more. That means, give or take ratios, you're working at a company that have at least a couple hundred employees into the thousands. The real value also of social is there a fact that there's somebody sitting in your human resources part, uh, department right now that is ex-university roommates with the decision maker. Or there's somebody in finance that golfs every Wednesday with a high decision maker of an organization. So I'm a believer that inside field sales, account management can all be leveraging it, and they can actually leverage the network of their own employees to help with introductions. So uh, there is an opportunity in all departments to be able to leverage social. Some more than others, but all. Many years ago, there was a woman who wrote a book, and her name is Patricia Siebold, I, I believe. And I'll just cut to the point. She basically said that every, you need to understand every touch point in your company. And when she wrote this book, there was no such thing as social. So touch points were primarily um, anybody that could get a phone call or would meet face to face. So a touch point was a rep sitting, I mean, it was a person sitting at the customer service table with someone that's meet face to face. Now, because of social, every single person is a potential touch point for your company. If you're not leveraging those touch points, you're leaving money and time on the table. Great. Yeah. Another question? Oh, no, along the same oh, lines. Say something. Yeah, so what happens is a lot of sales reps are like, oh, you're giving, me, you're giving me more to-dos. You're giving me more work. And a lot of people won't accept social selling, and a lot of, a lot of them are going to have a hard time integrating it to their traditional selling, especially those top sales reps who have sold a lot and made millions. They're like, why would I want to start doing social selling? I'm already successful. But then once they start seeing a few wins, especially of those people who are onboarding and ramp and they're like a sponge, they're absorbing all the information, those are the best people that I like to teach social selling to. They'll integrate it into their workflow. Pretty nice. Before we make the next question, I want to make a prediction here. I want you guys to write this one down. Okay? I predict the best sales reps in the near future will generate their own leads and bypass marketing. Which I say it used that again? to be, by the way, it's how it used to be. Yep. Right? When I sold, marketing did what? Nothing for me. You did it yourself. Yep. Now we've moved away from that, and I think we And right. this is the way you do it. Our number one rep, who was number one BDR, number one small business, and now number one mid market. Right, and them, right? Yep. 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 And they're the biggest sales. And it's all LinkedIn. And everybody has an opportunity now to be their own publisher of content. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, there's a new tool in LinkedIn called Publishing uh, under the Pulse you know, network of, of their organization. I can publish, and I can even republish existing content from our company's website and have a call to action. And specifically, it could be a call to action based off of my network. So I can have it, depends on how I place the call to action. People are driven to my LinkedIn page, my content, an asset that they downloaded, and it can be given credit to me as an individual. So every, there is an absolute future where an individual contributor could, could and I don't know if they're going to get in the content creation space, but they could be in the content distribution to lead phase absolutely, on their own. Absolutely, absolutely. We have a question right here. Apologize I barged in on you, but I had to say that. Uh, Ken, that was actually a perfect lead into because that's exactly where I was going with it. You know, na, 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 exactly. <laughs> and that is that the, the people that utilize social media 
for social selling are the ones that are doing that proactive searching to find the right people, to connect with the right people. So one insert I want to put in here is that some of these larger enterprise corporations have an issue with their reps blogging and posting things on Twitter. So, so well. You're right. I'm, I'm giving you some love. It just exhausts me. Raspberries are perfect. All. It's a perfect, appropriate fit. We don't have any lawyers in here, so I agree. But there is, there is that issue. So I exercise caution in regards to that. But you know what, but take this, we said the same thing about email. So those of you who are old enough, do you remember when email came out? Not everybody got an email account. Because some clown in, uh, in legal was like, well, what if they write something wrong to the customer and piss us all off? We've been, and then not everybody got a phone. Some of us are old enough to remember when not everybody got a phone put on their desk. For the same reason, don't give everybody a phone. They might call someone and say the wrong thing. We've been saying the same thing forever. Okay, Keenan. All right, so we'll, we'll, right. I'm agreeing that, with you. That's like apples and oranges, but that's okay. <laughs> Completely disagree. No, no, no. It's, it's a good comment. That was an aside. My real point was this, is that when it comes to doing what Ken talked about, finding our own, developing our own business, it's, it's, tr it's tracing and following people, you know, like Jamie's talking about on LinkedIn. I've been connected with Jamie for a long time. It's very helpful because things he posts, I can repost, whatever, it's great. But now I'm starting to tell the reps, follow the people that you're trying to target on Twitter. Follow the own, your own leaders in your own company on Twitter to see what they're posting. So there's so much more that the reps can do beyond their own posting and blogging. Some people don't want to do it. They're afraid to do it, and then legal's pushing them down like I was talking about. But they're, it, it, this is ripe, so this is good, and, and I appreciate all that you're saying. Social hey, can I just elaborate to what, what Gary's saying? And when I started my business three years ago, we didn't create our own original content. And the, one of the biggest ways that we kick-started, and, and this can happen at the individual sales rep level, and it is, it is coined a term influencer marketing, but it goes beyond the marketing phase to the sales phase. I looked out and tried to figure out there's Lori, there's Trish, there's Ken, there's Jim. There are people that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. And I leveraged their content to make me appear smarter. And eventually, I, I read so much of it that I started to develop my own voice you know, in social. But the idea that you can actually find influencers, and there's rock stars in every industry, no matter how unsexy you think your industry is. There are rock stars. You could follow these people, and these people write original content that can propel you to appear smarter and more insightful to your industry. In fact, can I jump in there? That, that's the exact metaphor. Curation before cu creation. Curation are the training wheels. That's it. You're curating other people's content that are great thinkers, and pretty soon it rubs off. And then I didn't use the word author, I wrote creation. You don't have to write, you can take a picture, you can do a video. Creation of any kind of content when you're finally ready to have your voice. But in the meantime, curate everybody else's so you can figure out where your voice even lies. Trish, how much did I suck out of your brain for about a year before we met? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a goofy question, fun, goofy question. Does clout matter anymore? Does peer index matter anymore? Yeah, we were actually uh, talking about that before we started. Uh, I would say it used to matter, and I'll tell you why. Because I remember when I was a lead gen rep at InsightSales.com or BDR, I, I was very proud that my clout score was higher than Ken Krogh's. <laughs> This is like three years ago. And I told them, what the freak good is Twitter anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so it started out as like, the, they're like the first company that ever measured how much influence, engagement, reach, voice you had throughout all your social media networks. LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, blog, you name it. So it started out like a good way to measure how much influence you have on social if you connect all your channels. Nowadays, I don't think it, it does matter that much. Um, so I have a cloud score of 74. What does that mean? That means that I'm really good at maneuvering and manipulating the algorithm of how it does to kind of spit out score. You know, that's my, my opinion. But notice he did tell you his cloud score. <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there other ways to measure success um, in social? The content. Yeah. yeah. Tell me more. What do you mean? The content. So just because someone today doesn't have a high cloud score, tons of false, if their content is just slick and really good and provides tons of value, 
they're going to be someone you need to follow and watch, and they're going to have clout. So it's, I just look at the content and the frequency of delivering badass content, and the rest takes care of itself. Well said. I was just going to say, as a lagging indicator, there's no question. It's in your CRM. This is all, it's all going to translate back to leads and contacts and opportunities that are being created because of these conversations. That's a lagging indicator. My leading indicator that I'm looking at right now, I want to see, I, I, look at, from, I look at my own personal network. I, I see myself as a digital newspaper. And every day, my job is to grow my newspaper subscribers. And that my social reach is growing at least by a person a day. So for me, the simplest gauge of current behavior or current indicator is that my personal network grows by one every single day. And there are a few others, but that's the easiest one. That's beautiful. We're going to allow the last comment to come from Jim, and I'm going to have each of you keep the aisles clear because he's going to be booking it through to the airport. He's got about a 130 flight. 115. 115, baby. Okay, say something. We love you, man. What do you want me to say? What are we the the, the most memorable thing you can think of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Social matters. Grab it. Get everybody involved in the organization and stop looking at it so linearly. Look at it broader. Hub and spoke. Thank you. 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 Love you, buddy. Love you. Love you. Be good. No worries. No worries. All right. We can ask one or two more questions. He's got to book it out of here. But um, <laughs> any last minute questions for the rest of our crew here? Trish. I have a, I have a question. Please. organizations Ooh, yeah. names at different times on different channels that's cool did you guys hear that yeah there's already stuff that does that like what well we'll talk about it after okay, <laughs> okay. No, oh, okay. One, one of them, there absolutely is yeah, yeah. There, there's one of them's called gaggle lamp does that advocate.com does that uh, uh, buffer uh, app a dynamic signal yeah. um, social chorus yeah there are you more okay. uh, in the employee app no, the right. ability to yeah. one one to many, the one to many model. One to many. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's cool. And, and for us, we we do this through oh, yeah. Hootsuite. I mean, uh, call me a, a homer for being a Canuck, but <laughs> the uh, Hootsuite is the the one to many system at the enterprise level. You can you can run a one to many system. We actually implement that at, at HireView. So everybody that's on board with HireView. Uh, automatically is going to be, uh, we have access to their Twitter account, their LinkedIn. That's just part of how our culture is. So with the click of a button, we throughout the whole day, everybody's going to be sending tweets that are higher view branded and on their LinkedIn. Yep. Not all at the same time, so it looks kind of spammy. Just stagger it. Stagger you heard it. a thunderclap? Yeah, but similar. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. And Hootsuite now is building, uh, comes out next month, where there will be a content library built within it. So you could pull from the library. Mm -hmm. Either the marketer or the individual sales rep can go in and oh, then really? yeah. assign content for the week. I mean, just pull up Twitter right now and you'll say, oh, Jamie, did you just tweet like 16 minutes ago you were on stage? It's because it's been <laughs> socially arranged. So, uh -oh, it's one to many. Yeah, our whole organization is set up that way. One last question. Yeah. Who wants it? Right here. Last question. How are you getting these touch points in LinkedIn, you know, sending a LinkedIn message to a prospect mm -hmm. or something into your CRM to then right. report on? I'm, I'm glad you're smart. That's a good question. <laughs> so because Peter is on board with us, this is guy's a genius. Um, we are, uh, because we have our, we talk to our Salesforce admin and have him create a drop down activity. So we say LinkedIn message in, LinkedIn message out, tweet, reply, favorite. It's kind of a pain. but. Yeah. They're manually logging it in. But at the, at the end of the day, we can say, how many retweets did it take to close a lead? How many favorites did it take? Right? It's all about the results, like Ken Crook's saying. And we're testing it. It's all about testing, right, Ken? If, I mean, don't be afraid of doing it. Just test it. And this might not work, but we just launched it a few weeks ago. And we're testing it with a small group of people. If this kills it, we'd be the first company in the world that's doing this. Or there's actually two tools. We already use one. We use Equire, and the, the one that we're switching to um, it's called Kite Desk, and oh, Kite yeah. Desk is one click of a button, and I can pull any record, uh, any contact information from LinkedIn to our Salesforce, and any conversation through an in-mail or mm -hmm. a free group message. It pulls everything, and, and I, can, I can have it set up as an activity record, a contact, a lead, uh, uh, an opportunity. 
fills in the, uh, the information, mm -hmm. including pick lists, uh, drop down tab, or pick lists, uh, little check tabs, the whole bit. Um, they're, they're dirt cheap tools. Um, now, Kite Desk is no longer able to use the LinkedIn API, but they still tag the, the data and bring it in, but it takes an extra step or two. They can also tap your CRM and your email, some other fun things, and, and use all those media together. It's, there's some and once you've synced it. one, say I sync Trish into my CRM, any activity going forward will now auto sync through. So I don't need to, I don't, yeah, so, and that includes email and includes uh, social. So now I don't need to constantly, every time I send Trish a message, send through. It just starts to create an auto workflow. Okay, so here's the currency of value we hope you've gotten today and that you'll give back a little bit to our wonderful speakers, maybe follow them. Jim Keenan, a sales guy, he had to take off his blogs. Awesome. Take the last minute, just tell them, how do they follow you guys out there on social? Please, everybody in the room, uh, add me to LinkedIn. It's probably, uh, that's the tool of choice for myself. Add me to LinkedIn. We'll be a, we, we are the resource for social selling training. I'm happy to help you in any way we can. Yeah, at Gabe VMSR on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, that's for me. So Gabe VMSR is not Villa Miser for all people out there. <laughs> uh, it's Gabe, G-A-B-E, and then VMSR is V-I-L-L-A-M-I-Z-A-R. Just like this. <laughs> and I'd be happy to connect. My name's Michael Hanks, so that's my LinkedIn, and then Twitter's Michael C. Hanks. So. All right, let's give him a hand, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Some of the best in the world right here.